Hello and welcome to this Tutor to You Economics Teacher webinar, the first in a series of three, really looking at how to get the best out of your teaching of the financial markets topic. This webinar focuses on money, its roles, its functions, how it's created, and central banks. Um, before we get going um, on the, the main body of this webinar, I just want to quickly draw your attention to our upcoming Grade Booster and Flying Start Economics workshops coming to a View Cinema near you very soon. Some of the events are already sold out, so if you would like to find out more or make a booking, please do take a look at the Tutor to You website to be able to do that. Some resources we think you might like, firstly our synoptic placemats. These will help you to prepare your students for the synoptic paper three. We'll be taking a look at some financial markets synoptic topics during the course of this webinar. There's also our highly popular key terms glossary written by myself and Jeff Riley, which contains all of the key terms that students might encounter or need to know in their linear economics A level. And available very, very soon from the tutor to you digital store are the model essay booklets complete with examiner commentary, lots of advice on how to structure essays and a whole range of examples of essays in a particular theme or topic. In terms of today's session aims, we're going to be taking a look at some of the student concerns over key concepts and tying that in with looking at some of the likely pitfalls and errors. We'll also be having a look at assessment and as I've already mentioned, really focusing on how that kind of assessment could be done in a very synoptic way. Here's a slide that you might want to just pause on while you're watching this webinar recording um, because I won't be going through this um, in detail, but it really outlines the syllabus requirements for this particular micro, this particular sort of small topic in financial markets. Um, this is not the entire financial markets coverage but it is the coverage in terms of money and central banking. So again, one for you to just pause on and really digest just in your own time and pace. So money, we're going to take a look at some of the common errors and likely pitfalls, which I've grouped into four areas. Firstly, our first banana skin here, the functions and characteristics of money. What we're finding is that students I can be finding it difficult to actually distinguish between the functions of money and the characteristics of money. So functions, what money does, and the characteristics, how we would describe it, what it's like. There's a little activity coming up in a few minutes that you could use in your classroom quite easily to help you teach that topic. The second banana skin, which is actually more concerning is what is meant by the money supply. It's not a straightforward concept at all. Students are used to, from their micro teaching in AS, they are used to the concept of supply being something that's quite easy to measure. Now that clearly isn't the case when we're talking about the money supply because there are a whole range of different measures depending on the degree of liquidity that is being considered. So for example, we might have what we call narrow money which is a very small amount of notes, coins, and certain types of retail deposits. We would call that M0, through to very broad money, much more, uh, much, much broader in scale. Um, we might call that M4. Just to give you some perspective, the value of notes and coins in the UK economy is actually only 3% of the overall money supply in the UK. And what it's really important for, you might be thinking, well, money supply, that's just a little bit of a topic at the start of a lesson, perhaps it's no big deal. But actually, students do need to have a reasonably good understanding of the money supply in order to help them generate those synoptic links that they will need for paper three. So, for example, they would need to understand how the money supply is measured in order to use, analyse and evaluate the quantity theory of money and the Fisher formula, for example. They should also understand that globalisation has had a reasonably big impact on how we understand the money supply, the role of international banks and deregulation in general in the financial services sector has meant that in a sense the money supply has increased 
and is under less control of the government perhaps or the central bank than it has been before. It will also help students to understand the nature and the underlying assumptions of the monetarist or neoclassical AD, short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply diagrams. So the, the point here is not just that the money supplies can be, can be difficult as a concept, but that an understanding of it has a big impact on other areas of your teaching. The final banana skin on this slide is to do with the money market. Um, now, this is perhaps less relevant to teachers following the Edexcel specification, um, of more relevance to AQA, but certainly of relevance to teachers following the OCR specification. It's really important that students get the right diagram here. The money market, the demand for money and the supply of money. Um, it's not the foreign exchange market. That's a very common error. Students get very confused between foreign exchange um, and, and the money market. The teachers following the OCR specification, you've got a little bit more work to do here compared to other exam boards. Your students will need to understand both the liquidity preference approach in which the money supply is regarded as inelastic and your students will need to understand the different reasons why people might demand money, precautionary, transactionary and speculation. Loanable funds is the other way that your students can think about the money market. And these, this is the way in which um, savings and investment work together in order to help determine the, um, the market rate of interest in the economy. So that's not really of relevance to most teachers in the UK, um, but it is relevant to teachers following the OCR specification. So in terms of activities, here's one idea. Perhaps ask students for additional characteristics that they think money should have. We outlined them on the previous slide, for example, durable and portable, but you could also get students to think about as many other characteristics. So perhaps easily divisible, um, non-perishable, um, something that has national significance, for example. There are a whole load of characteristics that students may come up with. I would then put up this picture of these rather juicy looking coconuts and ask your students to imagine that they are on a desert island somewhere warm in the, in the Pacific. Based on the money characteristics that they have identified, could those coconuts be regarded as money? It's a really nice starting point for them. It's a little bit of fun. You could actually choose any other product. Um, and a, a great way to end this activity is actually to talk to students about other things that have been used as money in different societies. So, for example, rice, sugar, shark teeth, conch shells and indeed coconuts. A second activity is to consider what we call the liquidity spectrum. So on the left hand side of the screen there for you is, is a spectrum from most liquid to least liquid. And on the right, there are eight possible things that could be regarded as money or have some sort of liquidity. You could simply ask students to decide where they might go on the spectrum. More interestingly though, is if there is any discrepancy between student answers or even your student answers and your own answers as a teacher. Why is there debate? Why is it not necessarily that easy? And actually, hopefully more able students will come to realise that how we regard liquidity is not hard and fixed, but it does actually depend perhaps on the stability of the economy and the credit worthiness of the government in terms of whether their, their bonds are sort of worth anything. Um, and indeed the, uh, the credibility of the central banks and monetary institutions. So these would be my suggested answers, but of course you could have debate over those in your classroom. But again, that's something you could easily just take a screenshot of um, and, and print out for students and have a really good discussion. So in terms of how money could possibly be assessed, the most likely from our, in our opinion at Tutor to You is that top band there, multiple choice questions. The topics we've looked at so far in terms of the roles and function of money, perhaps demand and supply of money, really lend itself to multiple choice questions in terms of definitions, diagrams, thinking about the liquidity spectrum, um, and perhaps also some synoptic links with other topics. We've made some suggestions there. 
There is a chance that it could come up as some sort of analytical question, an analysis question, the green band in the middle, like using diagrams to explain the impact of changes um, or the importance of the money market for an economy. It's probably pretty unlikely that there is enough material there for discursive or evaluative questions. But again, what I really want to encourage you to think about is the synoptic importance of this. And again, we'll come back to this as we work through this webinar. So moving on to our second big topic of this webinar, the role of central banks. I've taken the eight roles or functions um, that are appearing on the screen right now directly from the Bank of England website. The top four that I'm just highlighting now are the roles that are specifically identified by the Edexcel syllabus. So if you are an Edexcel teacher, it's those four that your students must know in terms of central bank and their roles. And again, I really want to encourage you to think about thinking synoptically with your students and constantly, constantly evaluating everything that you're teaching. So for example, different countries have a slightly different perspective on the role and function of their central bank. Um, their central banks will have different functions depending on, say, the degree of development in a particular economy. They'll have different targets. They'll use different policy instruments. So for example, countries which have a fixed exchange rate will use their monetary policy and their central banks in a different way to countries where there is a free float exchange rate. The final bullet point there is quite important. Central banks will operate differently depending on how independent of government they are. And in a sense, the degree um, to which governments provide targets or require central banks to comply with um, other government policies. So always, always take the opportunity to evaluate wherever possible. One way of helping students to develop their ideas in this way is to play the whose bank am I game. This is so easily adaptable. Um, I'm just going to show you two examples here. So for example, flash up a picture of a country's central bank, ask students to work out which central bank it is. Now this one is the US Federal Reserve. And then you could ask students to go away perhaps and find out some key features. I've identified some there. This bank, very hard to get a picture of this one without the giveaway flag in front, but this is the European Central Bank. And again, some key features of that central bank just jotted down there. Um, quite easily extended, um, quite an easily extendable activity um, and quite fun as well for students. Just a little bit of something different. Thinking about the creation of money. Now, I think this is something that teachers um, of the older generation who were teaching economics before the curriculum 2000 changes um, have probably been dusting off their money, money creation notes. Um, this was on the old A-level specifications when in the days where A-levels were linear um, before the modular system was introduced. Um, lots of the key terms that appear on the left hand side of this screen um, are not necessarily terms that appear specifically on the exam board specification. Um, we get a lot of questions into tutor to you asking us whether students need to know certain topics um, and the degree to which they know them. Now, our guidance is that if the word or phrase does not appear specifically on the syllabus, then a specific question should not be asked about that concept. However, there is a whole range of terminology out there that will help students um, to actually answer other questions. So whilst a question may not specifically require these key terms and phrases, students can of course deploy them effectively in other ways. So all of the words on the left there in the blue boxes are entirely relevant when we're talking about expansionary monetary policy at A level standard rather than just AS. Um, the purpose of this activity on the screen at the moment is simply to show just a quick way of um, building in key terms and definitions without it just being um, the usual run of the mill PowerPoint, you know, key term definition. 
providing a selection and seeing if students can use their initiative to work out how to connect the key terms to the correct definition. So the arrows that have now appeared on the screen um, should provide the correct answers in this case. And the point I've already made, um, thinking synoptically, no, these key terms may not appear on your exam board syllabus, but actually the concept of fractional reserve banking for which all of these key terms are related, that is effectively expansionary monetary policy and students are expected to know the up-to-date features and types of modern monetary policy. So in a sense, you really need to be thinking um, above and beyond what words specifically appear on the syllabus. So how is money created? The very first approach I'm going to show you is the way that appears in nearly every economics textbook that I have seen um, and is certainly the way that this was taught pre-curriculum 2000. So if we imagine going from left to right across the screen. Um, effectively, what happens is that the central bank creates narrow money um, and it lends to commercial banks. Um, or perhaps a slightly more modern twist, it makes asset purchases, um, which is what we're calling quantitative easing. So the value of deposits actually rises in commercial banks as a result of the creation of narrow money. A proportion of those deposits is then kept by commercial banks if the country has a required reserve ratio that will be dictated for them and the remainder is lent out. So just to think about this in terms of practical numbers, suppose that the central bank creates an extra £100. So that goes into um, deposits in commercial banks. If the required reserve ratio is 10%, then the commercial banks will save 10%, so £10, and they will lend out £90. That £90, we then assume, is deposited back into commercial banks, who can then retain 10% of that, which is £9, and lend out the remaining, the remainder, um, the 90% remainder, which is £81. So already in this process, the value of our deposits equals the initial £100, the secondary £90, and then the £81. And this process continues. Um, the multiplier there is 1 over R, where R is the reserve ratio. So that's the traditional view. Um, and that, that is still, um, in a sense, the main way in which, in which money is created. But it's certainly not the only way. And it's really important, we think, that your students understand the modern aspect. So commercial banks don't just have to wait for the central bank to create money and deposit it. They can actually raise additional capital through issuing shares or bonds. Um, and that then allows them to lend. The process is exactly the same from that point onwards. The key point is that actually central banks don't have to initially create the money. So just a little up to date perspective on that. Um, we think it's really important that students understand actually what is going on day to day. Um, economics for many years, I think, was a very theoretical subject and textbook heavy. Um, it's much more engaging and much more interesting than that. It's really important that students have a good understanding of some of the facts and figures and how it relates to the economy. I just flashed up three there initially. So retail funding being the main source of funding. Knowing this sort of data gives students the tools that they need in order to evaluate effectively because it allows them to add weight to their arguments. Second point there, a different range of interest rates. Lots of students won't know that. Um, there's a lot of cultural capital, my phrase, I guess, a lot of cultural capital missing for many 16 to 19 year olds. They might have very rarely engaged with the bank. They might not know that there are different rates for different types of accounts. And um, the final point there, I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, over the last 40 years, commercial banks have increased the money supply by 11 and percent each year. So think about the impact of that um, sort of injection of cash um, on house prices and, and the purchase of other assets. To what extent could this credit creation have been responsible for asset bubbles and subsequent crashes? It's an interesting question and a very synoptic question. 
Uh, we mentioned this fact earlier. Um, the phrase that's in this particular bullet point, I think is fantastic. Um, the idea of pushing on a string. And you will see this in quite a lot of um, arguments and articles, journal articles on the effectiveness of monetary policy. So following the financial crisis, the Bank of England and other central banks try to use quantitative easing to kind of kickstart the economy back into action. But what really happened was that the, the commercial banks that would normally be responsible for taking in deposits and lending out, um, they actually ended up just building up excess reserves. So the deposits were increasing, but they just weren't lending out. Um, so that link between narrow money and the creation of broad money really weakened. And so you can see what you've got there is evaluation of the effectiveness of monetary policy. But we've reached it by thinking about financial markets. Um, and just some data to finish with there on reserve requirements. So how could all of this be assessed? Well, it really does depend on the exam board that you teach. Um, and I would urge you to just go back and take a look at the slide earlier in this webinar with the table that outlined the topics that you need. Multiple choice questions seem very likely. It's a very quick and easy way to um, ask quantitative skills questions, for example, and basic definitions questions. What we think is perhaps most likely are the synoptic style questions. So the question might not be obviously about financial markets. It could be on monetary policy or government intervention, globalisation, um, economic stability, anything really. Um, but we would expect students, the very best answers, the very best students to be drawing on their financial markets material in order to answer those questions. Now, obviously, it could be entirely possible to answer those questions without the financial markets knowledge. They could even be the same sorts of questions that appeared on the legacy specifications, um, where obviously financial markets was not a big topic. But we really think it's important to help students engage with this material in a very synoptic way. So just very, uh, for the last few minutes, um, I just wanted to draw your attention to a few more of the, uh, the so-called banana skins, commonly confused terms and concepts. Um, we'll be working on these in session three in our Grade Booster student revision workshops in particular. But it's worth just flagging up here that we've spotted students making mistakes and confusing these terms in each bullet point. Ho hopefully that should be helpful with your teaching. Um, we've got a few multiple choice questions just flashed up here. Again, we've taken these from our Grade Booster workshop. So partly a chance for you to see the kinds of questions we'll be tackling, but also a chance for you to see the style of questions that we think could be likely on the exam. So for example, on the left there, effectively those are basic definition questions, knowledge-based questions. Um, the questions on the right would only really be relevant to students taking the OCR exam. Um, but more evidence of the need for calculation and quantitative skills. Other approaches to teaching. Um, we'll start at the top of this slide and work our way round clockwise. Um, actually taking your students to visit a bank and talking to bank managers, finding out about the different products that are available, um, the specific needs of customers and the issues that are faced. That would be a fantastic short field trip. Um, you could also help to help students to conduct primary research, get them to write surveys, go and ask friends, families, teachers. Questions such as, you know, how much cash do you tend to carry? How do you tend to pay for things when you're out and about? What types of bank accounts do you have? How are you saving for the future? Are you saving for the future? What factors determine your saving? Actually getting them to talk to people who have had to make these decisions that obviously your typical 16 to 19 year old, unless they're slightly more unusual, will not have had to make those decisions themselves. So it's worth helping them understand this from a practical perspective. You might also want them to practice analytical chains, always good practice for every topic, make connections in terms of their revision, um, really encouraging students to think globally and not just about the UK. So knowing about different central banks, for example, and different types of monetary policy, um, really helpful. 
And don't forget to make links with behavioural economics as well. In terms of looking at, say, bounded rationality, why do people not save? Um, all kinds of questions like that would be really interesting. Other sources for, um, for you to help with teaching, there are loads of our student webinar videos and topic videos and study notes covering pretty much everything that your students need to know for their exam. So please do take a look at them. And the third bullet point there, um, the Bank of England's quarterly bulletin of 2014 quarter one had a fantastic and accessible by Bank of England standards um, article on money creation in the modern economy, well worth a read. Um, and the website at the bottom there, positivemoney.org, has some fantastic stuff on there about what is money, its roles, its functions. It's very accessible um, and even weaker students would get an, a huge amount out of that particular website. Um, we have said that there aren't going to be many questions, in our opinion, that are discursive or evaluative on this topic. But we've just popped some on the screen there and um, there's something you might want to go away and perhaps think about or get your students to think about. And um, we're also making available a free model essay on this topic. And um, the first paragraph is shown on the screen there and you can download that from the tutor to you blog. There is a blog post from March the 12th in the evening of March the 12th that provides that essay as a as a PDF download, along with the slides from this webinar um, without the voiceover, which is something you might want to use in your classroom. So do take a look at that. So our key learning points from today, accurate definitions are really, really important. Clearly that's true of all economics. Um, but in this case, I think lots of the definitions are fairly alien to students and indeed many teachers. So working on building confidence with that is really important. We also think that financial markets material is likely to be used in fairly unexpected places. Really encourage students to bring in their knowledge of financial markets into any other question that where it could be relevant and having up to date knowledge about banks and financial markets is really important. So that brings us to the close of this first Teacher Financial Markets webinar. There are two more for you to look out for. Um, the recordings, the slides and the resources will all appear on the tutor to you blog in the coming weeks. In the meantime, if you have any questions, we're always really happy to hear from you. You can email me on ruth at tutor to you net and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks for your attention. And hopefully we will see you at CPD events, either face-to-face -face or online, or our student workshops very soon.